Well, thank you, everybody. I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, thank you, Mr. Melton. <laughs> he has my favorite hairstyle. <laughs> yeah. he, um, I thought, actually, I would start today um, by telling you something about the minister you didn't have, who isn't here. Um, and I did this in part um, because yesterday actually was the 12th anniversary of Drew's death. So, um, and as any of us know who's lost someone, there's always kind of an anniversary whether you mark it or not. So in general, we try to just go ahead and mark it and then we've done it. Um, because Drew, in fact, was the first of the two of us to imagine himself as a Unitarian Universalist minister. He would have been a UU. We had by that time been members of the UU Church in Rockland, Maine, thanks to Harold Babcock, um, for five years, I think. Um, and so he had started sort of checking into, you know, where he could go to seminary and what you had to do and what the UUA required of you and all of this. And he figured he would kind of pick away at it because he was still a state trooper in Maine. So he figured he'd pick away at it, and eventually he would retire from the Maine State Police. And um, by that time, he would have finished his degree, and he could be a Unitarian Universalist minister. Now, you got a picture, a state trooper. And I'm sure you have an image of your, in your mind of what a state trooper looks like. That was him. Okay? He was, um, he was about seam size. He was about that tall and, a, you know, um, and high, tight haircut, very shiny leather gear, shiny shoes, and um, very, very stern most of the time. And he could walk like this up to your car, license and registration. Um, I got a good story, actually, from Charles Stevens, Charles Stevens uh, who, out in Nebraska. I was in Nebraska. And he um, said that he was actually had finished doing a service at the Rockland UU. And um, was, his wife was driving him home. And, and, you know, she was a little heavy on the accelerator, evidently. Um, and all of a sudden, they see the blue lights behind them, woo, 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 and <coughs> pull over. And she, you know, gets the license and registration. He's, you know, here's this. Then he looks down and he goes, didn't you just preach at my church? <laughs> He'd never been so thrilled to be a Unitarian. But, um, <laughs> so, okay, so that was, so that was Drew. Um, so he, uh, one day he was at the barracks, Thomaston Barracks, and he saw a notice up in the trooper's room that said um, there was an opening for a new position, the civil rights enforcement officer. He's like, oh, God, so he gets a pen, you know, and he puts his name up there in real big letters because he doesn't want anybody else getting in there first. Puts his name up there. He was the only name on the list. But um, so he got the job. No extra pay or anything. It was just some training. And so he goes into the sergeant's office, and the sergeant says, well, you got the job, Griffith. Here it is, you know. And Drew said, well, in my capacity as the civil rights enforcement officer, I'm going to start going to the gay and lesbian pizza night at the Unitarian Church every Friday night in uniform. And the sergeant, the sergeant said, well, okay, Griffith, but why would you do that? And Drew said, well, you know, we live in Rockland, Maine. We don't have a lot of ethnic minorities here. We don't have a lot of religious minorities here. So people who are likely to be having problems of this kind are going to be gay, lesbian, transgender, and bisexual. Well, the sergeant actually, I think, agreed to this mostly to get him out of the office before he said that trans word again. Because <laughs> that really, like, weirded him out. So um, off Drew goes, you know, Friday night in his uniform, shiny leather gear, everything, goes in. And uh, the first night, he, the first Friday night he was there, a couple of people actually showed up, saw the cruiser in the parking lot, <laughs> and, like, whoosh, and they left. But by the following week, the word had gotten out that this main state trooper was actually pretty cool, and the word had also gotten out in certain circles that he was also pretty cute. <laughs> so they all came back, and um, he went every Friday night, got to know everybody. So um, he then became very active in the, uh, the first, and this is too complicated to explain, but in effect it was the first gay rights referendum question. Um, and he got very involved in that. And, uh, 
it was great because actually he could go places that lots of other people who were involved in it weren't likely to be. He was in fire stations. He was with paramedics. He was in, you know, courts sitting around with other cops shooting the breeze, and um, and really was a very loud and forceful advocate for um, passage of this kind of. It wasn't a gay rights amendment, but in effect, it was a gay rights amendment. So, um, so that was good. So, next thing, you know, Drew has found a. Oh, and he was also a welcoming congregation coordinator, um, one of the first ones at our church. Anyway, so he, he uh, found himself a, like a pink triangle reflector. <laughs> and he put it on his cruiser. <laughs> so, you know, the sergeant comes out and <laughs> sees it there. And um, he's like, Griffith, what the hell is that? <laughs> and uh, Drew said, well, that is my, um, you know, it's a symbol for gay, lesbian, trans, okay, okay, <laughs> what is it? Well, my thought, sir, was that um, if I were to stop someone who was gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual, and they saw this pink triangle glowing on my state police cruiser, that they would know that however dim a view I might take of their particular infraction, I was not a homophobe, and they would be comfortable. And the sergeant said, well, that's, that's really nice, but um, you're not actually allowed to put stickers on your cruiser. <laughs> and Drew said, well, actually, um, the guys who have been in the Marine Corps are allowed to have a Marine Corps sticker on their cruiser. That's my Marine Corps sticker. And it stayed. <laughs> so that was him. Um, and there are times when, you know, obviously the kids and I know what we've lost. Um, but there are times when I remember what all of us lost. Um, and what is important to, for me to remember in my role um, is not so much that I, you know, I, I say this in the book, the, that the temptation always for anybody who was writing about me when I was a chaplain, let alone, you know, writing a book, was that I was sort of this plucky widow. Right, and I, we are out on the field of battle, and Drew fell and dropped the standard, and I picked it up and kept going, um, which in a sense is true, but it's also true of any of us who lose someone we love. You have to pick up the standard and keep going. So um, I am not the minister he would have been. Uh, he would have been doing something else, uh, which is a, um, and it would have been neat, a very cool thing to do. But whatever it was, um, but I also understand very clearly having been the warden service chaplain, a law enforcement chaplain for um, seven years, uh, that he wasn't alone. Um, he wasn't actually the only state trooper, the only uh, law enforcement person, officer in Maine, um, or in the country who really brought that kind of energy to work that we tend to see as kind of literally uniform, as if the people are are only what we see on the outside and what we imagine on the outside. And um, the way I know that is that I work with guys who wear uniforms and wear guns and are trained in the use of force and the whole bit. Um, and if, even if I wasn't watching them do what they do all of the time, even if I wasn't watching them be there when you need them, and believe me, when you need a game warden, you don't want me. Okay, I mean, I'm nice, I, it's a great thing, um, but they do the thing that you really want. They find your child, you know, they find your grandmother who's wandering in the woods. Um, they go down and get the body of your husband out from under the ice. Um, and they do it at tremendous personal risk and they do it at, um, with, with soft hearts. They like to hide that, they like to forget that, um, but their hearts are soft. Uh, and even if I wasn't seeing them do this every day, day after day, I would know it because actually the chaplaincy of the main warden service isn't mine. It doesn't belong to me. I didn't begin it. It was begun by game wardens. It is continued by game wardens. It will hopefully, with any luck, transcend me and go on beyond me. This is their ministry. The only reason I know something's going on in the woods is they call me. They make the space for me to come in, and they do that because they recognized that when people are in these situations out in the world um, and, and are suffering, that they want to be able to relieve that suffering, and they can't. 